Welcome students to lecture six of MHHS 1. This is our second lecture on Annika Spears' essay, Incorporating Activist-Oriented Theater into the Feminist Studies Classroom. Last time, we discussed the essay's case study of embodied performance, um, a practice that integrates uh, theatrical source material with the changing social and political lived experiences of performers. Um, so what's extremely important to take away um, from that last lecture and from Spears' example is that the historical past is never just dead material. We're never, we're, we're never just done with the past. So in your own humanities education, I encourage you not to shy away from historically older material um, just because you think it quaint and antiquated. Remember those three stories that we heard last time. You might think that the past was so stupid that it thought that the sun revolved around the earth. What could such a stupid time possibly offer to us? But with something like an embodied performance, you can imagine yourself uh, maybe in Copernicus's time, uh, you probably would have believed in the same geocentric nonsense. And it wasn't just Copernicus who spurred us on to uh, greater and greater astronomical truths. Ancient Greek astronomers, for example, already knew that the earth revolved around the sun, but because of cultural developments, that knowledge um, was changed. It was revised into that very geocentric model that Copernicus was fighting against. So history, as one of the Middlebury College students realized, I believe that was Zoe, um, is never just uninterrupted progress to truth. Medical science, too, is a kind of knowledge that is always negotiated and produced by cultural forces. And historical moments of activism, like Paula Kamen's strangely antiquated emphasis on motherhood in her abortion activism, had its place and is still valuable to interrogate. In their embodied performances, the students realized that we, we haven't just moved on to greater and better intersectional feminisms. Um, it's much more complicated than that. It's much more complicated than we're much better than them. Um, in this lecture, I'll give you three historical moments of reproductive activism that illustrate Spears' important point about the pedagogical value of embodied performance. So I'll start with something near and dear to me as a specialist in the Romantic era of the late 18th and early 19th centuries, the work of Mary Wollstonecraft. You might be familiar with that name. Um, she's considered the founder of Anglo-American feminism. Next, I'll move on to a heated moment in queer theory in the early 2000s. And finally, third and finally, um, we'll get to a kind of post-Dobbs reassessment of Spears' experiment with embodied performance. So just to sum up, we'll go from 1792 to 2004, and finally to 2022. In 1792, Mary Wollstonecraft published the foundational work of Anglo-American feminism, The Vindication of the Rights of Woman. There, she made the radical argument that patriarchal institutions like the marriage market, like gender-biased educational systems, and like sexist laws, that, um, all of these things have constructed womanhood as silly, fragile, and dependent, and manhood as libidinous, domineering, and brutish. Patriarchal institutions, um, according to Wollstonecraft, had destroyed both sexes. Instead, she placed value on the rational education of both sexes, emphasizing especially that women should be educated in more than just what were known at the time as the accomplishments. And these accomplishments included things like drawing, needlework, and music. Basically, women were taught what they needed to entertain their men. Um, Wollstonecraft insisted instead that equal access to rational education would better society. So um, a sign of this poor education, according to Wollstonecraft, was the 18th century cult of sensibility. Um, the cult, uh, sorry, the, the construction of 18th century gender roles uh, made men into rational and physical beings and women into emotional messes that gravitated towards aesthetic, moral, and spiritual questions. So there was this great divide. This meant that women possessed more than men what was known as sensibility. Um, a word that you might be familiar with if you're a Jane Austen fan. Um, think of the novel Sense and Sensibility. 
This meant that you were just basically ruled by your heart rather than your head. You had a refined taste for pretty things. You had elegant manners, and you navigated your social circles with sweetness and compliancy. Sensibility was a cultural product of the unequal education of women. And only when women are granted equal access to rational education, according to Wollstonecraft again, can men and women coexist as partners. So that's the super, really, really abridged version of the Vindication. Um, it's an entire book, and I urge you to read the book in its entirety. So I bring this up um, just because this foundational work of radical feminism has uh, been caught up recently in contemporary abortion debates. Anti-abortion activists want to point to a really, really cherry-picked passage from the Vindication to say that Wollstonecraft made a feminist case against abortion in 1792, and uh, that the anti-choice message has its foundation in early feminist ideology. Um, they want to say to all the feminists out there, basically, like, if you love Wollstonecraft so much, you should be against abortion like she was. Um, so that's their pitch. So this is the passage, um, here's the, the controversial passage that these anti-choice activists like to point to. Quote, and this is from the Vindication. Women are made systematically voluptuous, and though they may not care, all carry their libertinism to the same height, yet this heartless intercourse with the sex which they allow themselves depraves both sexes, because the taste of men is vitiated, and women of all classes naturally square their behavior to gratify the taste by which they obtain pleasure and power. Women becoming consequently weaker in mind and body than they ought to be were one of the grand ends of their being taken into the account that of bearing and nursing children have not sufficient strength to discharge the first duty of a mother and sacrificing to lasciviousness the parental affection that ennobles instinct either destroy the embryo in the womb or cast it off when born. Nature in everything demands respect, and those who violate her laws seldom violate them with impunity. The weak, enervated women who particularly catch the attention of libertines are unfit to be mothers, though they may conceive so that the rich sensualist who has rioted among women spreading depravity, depravity and misery when he wishes to perpetuate his name receives from his wife only a half-formed being that inherits both its father's and mother's weakness. So that was a large chunk of text, so let me break it down. I've quoted this large chunk of text just to show you uh, some of the context that these anti-choice activists omit when they cherry pick this passage. Generally, they only quote the part about, quote, the first duty of a mother and the negative representation of a mother, quote, destroying the embryo in the womb or casting it off when born. So the omitted, the omitted full context here is of the miseducated woman of accomplishments. This woman has only been socialized to be the plaything of men and actually has zero agency here. So choice is not even an issue here. She has been, quote, made, uh, she has been, quote, made systematically voluptuous. Her only task is to, quote, gratify the taste by which they obtain pleasure and power. Now, these, quote, weak, enervated mothers, again, have no agency. They have no choice at all but to terminate their pregnancies uh, so that they can continue attracting the attention of horny and powerful men. So Wollstonecraft's argument is really not about the ethics of morality about the ethics or morality of abortion per se. It is about the sexist conditions that force that choice upon women to survive the patriarchal institutions of the late 18th century world. Whereas Wollstonecraft wrote the vindication in just six weeks, um, she spent over a year trying to finish her novel Mariah or The Wrongs of Woman. Now, this unfinished novel, I think, is what Speer would call Wollstonecraft's embodied performance of the vindication. Um, just a little genre note here. The Vindication was a nonfiction rational appeal, but Mariah was a fictionalized performance of those principles in embodied action. The main character, Mariah, is imprisoned um, in an insane asylum by her husband 
where she develops a bond with Jemima, a lower class woman who is serving as an attendant in the asylum. Jemima is an orphan who served an abusive master who beat her and, um, and raped her. Um, after she became pregnant with her master's child, she was turned out of the house and she successfully terminated her pregnancy. Um, and just, just a side note here to, to just show how radical this is. This is probably um, the first novel in literary history to portray a successful abortion. So again, this is not, as those conservative readers of Wollstonecraft want it to be, uh, an argument about how horrific abortion is. Given the full context of Wollstonecraft's career, this is actually an, uh, an argument about how horrific patriarchy is. It denies women agency and choice, even in the realm of her, um, her own reproductive body. So um, all of that is to say, I, I'm singling out this contemporary misreading of Wollstonecraft to show how history is still alive and it's still producing readings and misreadings with sky high sociopolitical stakes. I'm also looking at Mariah as a kind of embodied performance of the vindication to show how Wollstonecraft herself made her nonfiction radical argument even more revolutionary when she translated it into fiction. In staging this incarcerated community of, quote, insane women, Wollstonecraft steps into the subject positions, into the bodies of um, individual women living in and surviving the patriarchal harm of, institution, of, of all the institutions around them. So, like uh, Zoe from the Spear essay, Wollstonecraft herself is showing the transformative power of embodying, uh, of embodying the performance of the lived experience of women. The second historical moment of reproductive justice activism that I want to highlight comes from a quick citation in the Spear essay on page 42. Um, so turn to that page. When Spear is discussing the GSFS course that she is visiting at Middlebury College, she talks about the syllabus and how a key component of the course was the, quote, queering potential of reproductive justice. <clears throat> so I single out this citation because one of the queer theorists mentioned on the syllabus is UCR's own Jennifer Doyle, one of my brilliant colleagues in the English department. So if you track this citation to the reference list, the assigned essay in that Middlebury College course, that GSFS course, was Doyle's essay, quote, Blind Spots and Failed Performance, Abortion, Feminism, and Queer Theory. So Doyle's 2009 essay was in part a response to the hot topic of queer theory provoked by the publication, um, the earlier publication of Lee Edelman's book, No Future, Queer Theory and the Death Drive, published in 2004. Edelman, a white gay man, tells a story about encountering a pro-life image of a fetus. Now that ad was advertising what he calls reproductive futurism, a kind of assumption that we are always fighting for our children because the children are our future. Instead, Edelman describes a kind of queerness as something that fights not for our children, but against the heteronormative protocols of reproductive futurism. So being queer for Edelman means resisting that, that call, that, re, that call of reproductive futurism, that call to imagine rosy utopian futures in our inevitable children. So now we can hear this in the students' responses, I think, to Paula Kamen's source material, especially in that ending that emphasized motherhood. A majority of those students identified as LGBTQIA, and they didn't see that harping on motherhood as a kind of positive ending. Instead, it looked like um, an enforced heteronormativity that equated motherhood, uh, womanhood with motherhood. It looked like a kind of compulsory future filled with children, Edelman's reproductive futurism. So Edelman's theoretical description of the queer rebel who sneers at these reproductive imperatives sounds cool and exciting, but as Doyle points out in her essay, the embodied performance of that queer rebellion is actually much more complicated. Doyle starts with, uh, with her own uh, personal story um, about her own experiences with reproductive justice issues. And she shows um, in that essay how lived gendered experience changes things. Edelman doesn't 
consider a vast body of feminist theoretical work, and he erases the woman's body from his uh, theoretical considerations of the queer rebel. Uh, Doyle fires back pointedly, quote, uh, and this is from her essay, wouldn't it be nice to imagine that children aren't our problem? So what she means by this question here, this pointed question, is that from Edelman's unexamined subject position as a white gay man, he has the privilege of imagining a kind of queer rebellion that really never has to think about the heteronormative image of the child that keeps constructing women's futures. Edelman's book has very little to say about what a woman would look like as a queer rebel who rejected the mandates of reproductive futurism, because Edelman himself refuses to imagine that lived embodied experience. So I want you to, to take it back to the essay now. Something similar happened in the classroom production of Jane that Spear talks about. Those students were queer theorists who reflexively chanted no future right along with Edelman. They probably read the, the Edelman book. Um, they rejected the idea of compulsory motherhood while Cayman thought, uh, while, while Cayman thought that there was something worth preserving there. Now, in the end, the embodied performance got those students um, and Cayman beyond mere theoretical notions of queerness and femininity and to the historically situated struggle of women just fighting for their lives. So just as conservative pro-lifers read a cherry-picked passage from Wollstonecraft as um, pure feminist theory rather than the embodied experience of um, a late 18th century radical woman, Edelman bases his theory of queer rebellion on the complete erasure of the lived realities of the woman's body. In both cases, something like embodied performance gets us closer to reproductive justice than abstract theorizing or fundamentalist moralizing. And finally, I want to speak briefly to 2022, two years after the publication of Spears' essay on the pedagogy of embodied performance in reproductive justice activism. So you might have been reading Spears' essay throughout with a kind of confused look as you were hearing about all those really progressive students who thought um, that the abortion issue was just completely antiquated and there were you know, much more important things to focus on. Um, you might have raised an eyebrow or two at that. In the, in the two years after Spears' essay, the majority conservative Supreme Court built up the legal framework to overturn this 1973 Roe decision that declared abortion constitutional. In the 2022 um, Dobbs decision, uh, the Supreme Court reversed half a century of legal precedent and ruled six to three that abortion is not constitutional. This, as you probably know, has meant that abortion has been made illegal in several states with what were known as trigger laws. In anticipation of the Supreme Court's reversal of Roe, these states had put in place laws that would immediately ban abortion as soon as the high court's ruling came through. So that's all the history uh, we have now. So um, given all this uh, intervening history, um, post Dobbs, uh, we are decidedly not done with the issue of reproductive justice, as some of those progressive students seem to have thought. We have not, in many ways, moved beyond those struggles of the women of the Jane Collective. History, um, again, quoting Zoe here, is certainly not a narrative of uninter uninterrupted progress. What needs to follow is more of this activism of embodied performance, of privileging the lived experiences and individual stories of the women affected by these political decisions about their bodies. We'll need to hear about women who now have to cross state lines for reproductive care. We'll need to hear about arbitrary non-medical philosophizing about how many weeks it takes for an embryo to get a soul. Um, in short, we'll need the still relevant embodied wisdom of those mothers from the Jane Collective and foundational feminists like Wollstonecraft, despite their unfashionable gender essentialism. So I'll leave you with uh, some, some more proof about how much we still need to listen to the, to the past. I've linked um, here uh, to a trailer for HBO's documentary, The Janes, that retells their story from a post-Dobbs perspective. Um, so even now, these Janes will have more to teach us. <laughs>